Well, we come here on Sundays and share ideas about the nature, what you might call the nature of the is, what's going on there. And that said, let me move with absolute faith to an understanding that the passage of time since our last connection has been a gentle occasion of relative tranquility, a few honest chuckles and a song or two sung in joyful remembrance that you are a well-loved, deeply appreciated participant in this incredibly rich adventure that we call unity. <laughs> Is that a sneer I hear, <laughs> rich? A flash of cynicism in your says who? I can hear your protest. I too have sat on society's knee and had the fairy tale read to me as well. The materialistic fable with the seductive moral that laying up fame, fortune, and culture correctness paves the golden road to happily ever after. And I too have been just as chagrined as you to discover that, alas, the tale was just a tale, and that the truth turns out to be a contradiction of the fiction. But take art. If you're out there singing the low-down, sick and tired of it blues, you do have alternatives. And the way to discover them is to get off by yourself somewhere, get still for a moment, watch your breath. Ah, watch your breath till your mind runs out of chatter. And then listen carefully. And after coming apart for a while, you are going to hear a supremely assured, still, small voice speaking to you from the secret place of the Most High, gently reminding you that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedest out of the mouth of God. Let your mind play with, with that radical insight for 40 days and 40 nights, and you'll begin to see ever so clearly that your feelings about the quality of your earth life have precious little to do with your ability to exercise dominion over the material domain, including how folks choose to behave. Cultivate the heart of that insight into consistent mindfulness, and your relationship with the world of form will mature into the don't worry, be happy genius of Alfred E. Newman himself. Don't worry, be happy. Hmm. Remember, Jesus had the temptation game run on him as well. The only difference being, unlike most of us, he didn't buy into treasure hunting as the three dimension level. He was committed to far bigger game, he was. He was intent on cornering the market all right, but he dealt in the awakened commerce of love and peace and joy, leaving the rat race for bucks and power and being right to the less insightful. He knew ever so clearly how foolish it was to lay the foundation of a peaceful, content life on the shifting sands of human behavior and endless episodes of acquisition and accumulation. He knew because he had that clear vision and no longer denied the impermanence of everything that occurs in space-time. He let us know in his own inimitable way that rust and dust simply don't make it as the cornerstone for something as enduring as God's eternal peace or love or joy. Nope. Man shall not live by bread alone, and neither shall the ladies. Mass ignorance of the wisdom contained in that revelation explains why so many of our brothers and sisters aren't living in any kind of truly fulfilled sense, especially, it seems, in the highly industrialized, super competitive, authoritarian cultures that have bread and morality coming out of their ears. And I would have to acknowledge, yes, society is just like ours. Even a cursory look at our society quickly reveals that in addition to a dazzling array of stuff and a highly refined uh, codes of religious, social, political, and legal and economic correctness, we must also acknowledge intolerable levels of poverty, violence, illiteracy, addiction, disease, and lest we forget lethal levels of intolerance, cruel bigotry, 
justified by a child of God's skin color, ethnic origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, economic class, political persuasion, age, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. A tragic ignorance of lethal indifference that makes it tough for anybody to taste the sweet nectar of God's cup of existence. It is a rare event, indeed, to encounter a being who is not living a life of quiet desperation, hauling around a heart playing out its drama in a theater of unfulfilled longings. Billions of God's children dealing with hearts full of fear and hostility and disappointment, seeking refuge from their despair and distractions like alcohol, Prozac, cocaine and pot and caffeine and nicotine and work and sex and TV and daily hunting and gathering excursions into the outback of the local mall. And all of it, all of it efficiently accounted for in the medical calculus. Today's healthcare community is quietly going nuts. In spite of a diagnostic and therapeutic armory that staggers the imagination, not to mention demolishing your pocketbook. They aren't even close to keeping up with epidemic levels of emotional illness and chronic degenerative psychosomatic diseases that are the inevitable human byproducts of social value systems that insist on confusing high levels of consumption and being right with a high standard of living. Could it be an unconscious intuitive recognition of the foolishness of that mentality that instructed the economic mind to label the national product gross. <laughs> the most recent guesstimate of the Surgeon General's office, for example, puts about 70 million Americans in the potentially hypertensive category. And that's about right on with the straw poll that I take occasionally at our local Kmart's free pressure checker. About one out of five or six of the folks I see checking it there hit the digits at better than 150 over 100. That's a lot of folks in this country whose bodies are telling them something. I got a hunch it's saying, take your preoccupation with elegant homes, with cars, fine cars, designer jeans, the end look, the right job, the perfect mate, cellulite, youth, fame, fortune, everybody's approval and being right and shove it, baby. Because <laughs> if you don't give me a little piece and a little few chuckles now and then, I'm out of here. You hear your body talking. Yeah, the body does grow weary of the hard climb to the top of the control and image charts. But if that isn't the way to grab a little lasting peace and contentment, and what is? What do we have to do to find a little peace, some harmony, and a healing portion of joy? That inquiry brings us to an interesting paradox that it seems must be understood to assess the Jesus turf, the kingdom of peace and love and joy that he called heaven. The truth of the matter seems to be suggesting that we don't have to do anything to find a little peace and contentment. Quite the contrary, peace and contentment find us effortlessly and spontaneously the moment we stop doing, the moment we cease playing the foolish mind games that distract us from the first, in the first place from our natural state of lighthearted serenity, our divine inheritance, the image and likeness of emotional perfection in which we were created. Each of us is blessed with an inner sea of tranquility whose basic nature is calm and serene. It represents the natural state of our emotional natures, but it responds to the thinking mind much like a punch bowl responds to movement. Imagine carrying a large, filled to the brim punch bowl from your kitchen to the serving table as I once did. Notice the agitated surface of the liquid as your movement creates turbulence sending the punch back and forth in waves from one side of the bowl to the other, perhaps even sloshing some of it over the edge now and then. And now carefully set the bowl down on the serving table and watch. Watch what happens. Spontaneously, with no effort on your part, the wave action of the liquid will begin to subside until eventually 
the surface of the punch bowl returns to its natural state of absolute stillness and calm. Nothing we do turns turbulence into serenity. It's what we stop doing that allows the liquid in the bowl to seek and find its natural state. And so it is with our human emotional nature. The force that agitates the calm serenity of our emotional sea of tranquility is our thinking mind, lost in dysfunctional patterns of unskillful use, spiritually defined as judging and coveting and hankering and clinging and infinite variations on the theme of bearing false witness. Or as Albert Ellis observes, you feel awful because you insist on awfulizing. You feel frustrated, resentful, and disappointed because you insist on masturbating. Catch that, please. Masturbating. I must, you must, it must, we must, must, we all must. Demanding your way through life. The unenlightened mind at play, singing its song of misery on high. You heard that one recently? It's on the hit parade of all psychiatrists. I cannot have all my wishes filled. Wine, wine, wine. I cannot have every frustration still. Wine, wine, wine. Life really owes me the things that I miss. Life has to promise eternal bliss. <laughs> and when I must settle for less than this. Wine, wine, wine. You got the picture. So peace is not a heavenly reward that you have to bust your fanny to invent. It's something you learn to allow. It is not something contextually determined by the ever-changing flow of form and circumstance that makes up our earth experience. It's something already inside you, waiting to be released. Released from the bondage of attachment and desiring and clinging and envy and, and greed. Just play with this idea for a while. No matter how hard you work at finding peace, you'll never discover it until you stop doing the foolish things that hide it from you in the first place. To search for peace while you continue to cling to and hanker after the things of the world is much like wishing a pond would become quiet and serene while you stand there chunking big rocks in it. <laughs> Remember, there is nothing you can stop doing that will do anything but create peace and serenity. The pond, the moment you stop throwing the rocks, the pond will return to its natural tranquil state all by itself. The God-given grace of peace and harmony floods our awareness with its healing, liberating presence the moment we choose to allow the foolish things to drop away. When Puck, remember him? A little Shakespeare here, sat up in his laughing tree and chuckled, what fools these mortals be. I got a hunch he was reflecting the foolishness of dedicating our creative energies to a way of life that encourages us to be constantly envious of the things we don't have and eternally greedy for the things we should have. I invite you all to explore the possibility that being stuck on the treadmill of accommodating a value system that depends on envy, greed, and being right for its survival has to be the epitome of the human predicament. The foundation of individual and planetary peace will never be laid on the treasures of Earth, including the treasures of social and ethical correctness. Let us remember that Jesus did not teach a merely social or ethical gospel. He taught an uncompromisingly spiritual gospel that challenges us to practice compassion and tolerance toward our brothers and sisters, especially when, we are going the, go, when they are goring the sacred oxen of social and ethical correctness. Remember, the teaching is to forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. It's not crucify them, Pop. They've transgressed my pet no-no. And yet many of us live from that one. I know I get stuck there. The popular notion of peace through prosperity, so attractive because it promises the best of both worlds, is in fact the very kind of thinking that perpetuates the malignant fear 
and conflict, the hunger and disease eating away the human dream of peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. Universal prosperity in the modern consumeristic sense, if attainable at all, can only be achieved by continuing to cultivate envy and greed as the motivating drivers of human behavior. And what possible good can come of that? Nothing destroys intelligence and serenity and happiness faster than a steady diet of wishing and wanting for that which you don't have. Papa Charlie Fillmore, founder, co-founder of Unity, said it like it is when he observed the soul wearies of the wear and tear of the artificial life. Oh, can you hear that one? And can you confirm it in your own experience? The soul wearies of the wear and tear of the artificial life, and nothing is more artificial than a life dedicated to the single-minded pursuit of more and more wealth and fame and authority. If your soul is feeling a little weary, dear hearts, perhaps it's telling you that it's time to give up some of the foolish attitudes and ideas that keep us in hot pursuit of the artificial. And I'm thinking that we've come to a point in our evolutionary journey where it can be fairly said that no one is truly dedicated to the quest for peace and planetary harmony unless she or he is working primarily for the restoration of wisdom to the way they live and embrace and thus encourage as a planetary model. And what is this wisdom that needs to be restored? It's the wisdom of Jesus saying, man does not live by bread alone. It is the wisdom of Gandhi observing, earth provides enough to satisfy everyone's needs but not enough to satisfy everyone's greed. It is the discriminating awareness that can tell the difference between real needs and artificial wants and chooses the joy and quiet dignity of voluntary simplicity. And it's the courage to give up the familiar for the unknown, the old wine for the new wine, the treasures on earth for a yoke that is easy, a burden that is light. The only way to travel, folks, Hit your life to a way of living that measures human worth by the sparkle in your eye, the song in your heart, and the wisdom to say, thank you, Father, for the blessing the moment contains. Walk that road for a while, and you'll never question the richness of your life again. You'll know what Thanksgiving is all about, too. Pure, free spirit, attached to nothing, celebrating everything. Yeah, it's rich. Doesn't get any richer than that. Bless you. And thank you for sharing that journey with me. God love you. Okay.